Andrew, you've recently done a, a brief for the Federal Trust on the subject of a level playing field. Um, I'd like in this podcast to discuss some of the thoughts and analyses you came up with. But can you begin by telling us what is the level playing field? It's a topic that people mention in the context of the Brexit negotiations, but what in general terms does it mean? The level playing field is a concept that is essentially designed to uh, ensure that should the European Union and the United Kingdom meet a free trade agreement under which the United Kingdom is given uh, tariff-free and quota-free access to European Union markets. The, the UK isn't able to exploit that access in ways that the European Union would regard as unacceptable. Does um, the British government accept that general principle or reject it entirely? Or is it a, a question of meeting in the middle? The, the United Kingdom government, last time I checked, uh, would say that they accept the principle that uh, they shouldn't be able to unfairly exploit uh, access to European Union markets. I mean, I suppose, who, who wouldn't uh, accept the principle that they shouldn't, they shouldn't behave unfairly? However, I think one, one of the, uh, the, the key areas of, of divergence that's opened up during negotiations is how do you actually go about uh, defining what that means and enforcing what that means? So I think from the UK point of view, the issue will be, should we actually be signed up to a binding agreement, which actually has force in UK law, which actually makes them go along with that. So that, that could be the area of, of, of disagreement. Can you say a bit more about the areas of disagreement? Are there questions about uh, whether, for instance, environmental and workers uh, issues should be part of the level playing field? Or is there a general agreement on what should be part of the level playing field? I think there's there's fairly broad agreement about uh, what generally should be in it. I think I think that the I think or rather I think the the bigger area of disagreement is the way in which it work in practice and particular uh, subject to contention has been this question of state aid, i.e., the extent to which uh, the UK or the EU can actually provide forms of assistance to their domestic industries and manufacturers, which will enable them to cut their own costs and sell things at a lower price. Uh, that's, that's a key area of, 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 of disagreement as I understand it. And one issue there, again, is, is not so much about the, the kind of rules that might be in the agreement, but exactly what having a common set of rules means. So, so, so one issue in which, in which there, there has been discussion is this area of, of what, what kind of rules should the UK adhere to? Should it adhere to basic existing EU laws as they stand now? Or should the UK actually be required to change its rules in future as the EU changes its rules? So it's, it's about whether this is an agreement uh, uh, a kind of snapshot of where we are now, which will continue to apply to, to, apply to the UK in future, or whether as the, as the EU changes its rules, the UK should be obliged to change its rules to, 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 uh, to retain alignment with the EU. And that's particularly an issue because I think the EU are keen on doing that in the area of state aid. Yeah. Um, I understand that the EU, that Bunny has hinted, there might be a bit more flexibility on that on what they call dynamic alignment than was the case at the beginning. Is it your impression that the two sides have been moving together on the question of the level playing field over the past couple of months? I think uh, the, the EU are always willing to be flexible up to a point, and we've seen that, that ultimately the EU do want a deal. They like to meet a deal. It's very inconvenient not to have a deal. However, uh, there are clearly some some issues, almost uh, philosophical issues, about how this should work. And, and we've seen increasingly in recent months, the UK government emphasise this idea of national sovereignty. The idea is that the UK is pulling out the European Union, is becoming a sovereign state, which the implication being that it wasn't a sovereign state when it was in the European Union, and now it's a sovereign state 
it's entitled to certain standards of treatment and almost to be treated as, a, as an equal with the EU because now it is a sovereign state. And from the point of view of the UK and the way in which the UK government presents the Brexit project, that means not being required to uh, uh, abide by somebody else's rules and certainly our le the UK legal system not being subject to some kind of external influence an external form of arbitration so it's going to be quite difficult I think to uh, to meet some kind of uh, landing zone between those two positions because the EU's attitude on those matters is quite different. Tell us about the specifically Irish aspect of the level playing field controversy. Well, the uh, obviously a lot of this is presently up for grabs and it does play into this national sovereignty issue. But, but clearly the uh, exit agreement and the Northern Ireland part of the exit agreement, which was at the time it was agreed presented as a triumph for the, U the UK government, the same Prime Minister we have now in the UK, uh, envisages that Northern Ireland will be more closely aligned to the European Union than the remainder of the UK, in other words, Great Britain. So going forward, as this kind of dy dynamic alignment issue will apply even more intensely to, uh, to Northern Ireland. So certainly Northern Ireland will remain very much within the EU uh, a sphere of influence in, to a greater extent even than the rest of the UK will. So clearly that's going to be, be an even greater point of tension. And if we're disagreeing over the level playing field and over the Northern Ireland Protocol at the same time, we, we've then got considerable difficulties in reaching any kind of agreement. Why do you think the issue of um, uh, disapplying or trying to disapply some of the withdrawal agreement provisions relating to Northern Ireland. Why has that come to a head now? Why didn't it come to a head six months ago? Is it part of the general negotiating dynamic? Yeah, I, I think it, that will be something to do with, as many of these things are, the internal politics of the Conservative Party, which at times in the minds of some people seem to take primacy over all other considerations of any kind anywhere in the world. And I think probably uh, what's gone on is as the negotiations have progressed and run into certain difficulties, it's become increasingly apparent that the, the Brexit project as sold is very difficult to reconcile with the general drift of what we signed up to in the exit agreement at, the, at late last year. And therefore, in order to try and escape from that political trap, the UK government has had to start doing things that they, they hope will please certain people within their own party. And one of them is introducing a bill which by their own omission uh, would, would contravene international law. Do you think we will leave or come to the end of the transition period with no deal? And if so, what difference would it make? And Spell that out in different ways, would you? Because it might make a political difference, it might make an economic difference, it might make a constitutional difference. Mm -hmm. So, do you think we'll leave with no deal? Uh, I think it's uh, it remains a possibility, and it's become a greater possibility. But I wouldn't like to say it will happen for certain. However, uh, there is a political difficulty, and we can see that the Prime Minister feels a political difficulty, and I think that's why he's introduced the legislation he has recently. And again, it's within his own party, which has always driven this. So, but it, so I think it, it remains a possibility, but, uh, but not inevitable, and there may be ways around it. But if we're going to get back to the question of what does a no deal mean, a no deal economically doesn't look very good, for the UK. It doesn't look very good for the EU either, but it looks a lot worse for the UK. So economically damaging. Politically, what does it look like? Uh, well, there's different ways of looking at that. There's politically on the world stage, by the looks of things, by the point we, we if we do end up in a no deal scenario, we may or may not have a different uh, US president who may not look particularly favourably on the way in which the UK has conducted itself. That's one issue to take into account. Uh, what it will do to our relations with the EU, well, it will, uh, it will certainly be a factor in ongoing negotiations because I think what you'll find is that although 
although if we do leave without a deal, that's not the end of the story, because at some point we'll want to come to some kind of agreement with the EU. And therefore, uh, if we leave without a deal, we will then be in a position where because of the economic damage being done, we need to find some kind of agreement that looks a bit like a deal. But at that point, the thing which the EU are offering, assuming the damage to the UK is greater than the damage to the to the EU, isn't going to change very much and may even get worse from the UK point of view. So there's no real escape, I think, from the UK needing some kind of a deal from the EU. So in that sense, the, the term no deal is a bit misleading. Then we get to in the internal politics of it. Uh, and there'll be some people in the Conservative Party who want no deal. I think that's pretty clear. And when we get it, even if it causes damage, we'll carry on saying it's a good thing and may even intensify their, their view that it's a good thing because they will presumably blame the European Union and find various other scapegoats within the UK for why we've come to this position. From the point of view of Boris Johnson, whether he becomes one of those scapegoats is quite an important question. Uh, so that there'll be a factor there. And then there's also the question of beyond that hardcore within the Conservative Party, within the Conservative Parliamentary Party, within the Conservative membership, what about the wider public beyond that? How do they feel about this? Do they start to turn increasingly against the idea of Brexit? Or does a kind of political campaign to, 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 to blame others for what's happened other than, than the Brexiteers work? Does it, does it turn them on uh, the EU even more? Does it turn them on the intelligentsia? Does it turn them on uh, the BBC? Do they blame others than, than the people who actually uh, uh, advocated Brexit in the first place? Those are questions we can't really know. You can never really know how these things are going to play out politically until they happen. But I think it will be it will be it will be a challenging time for Johnson as Prime Minister if we do leave without a deal. But on the other hand, the only any the only kind of deal that's really on offer is also going to be challenging from the point of view of Don Johnson because he's got to sell it within his own party. Let, let me put a final point to you, Andrew. Uh, even if we do get a, a deal by which we leave the the customs union and the single market there's going to be great economic disruption at the beginning of next year and probably throughout the whole of next year may it not be more politically tempting and convenient for boris johnson to say let's take it on the chin as he might put it uh, and um, accept these difficulties um, but say it's not a problem with brexit the difficulties stem from the intransigence of the europeans who forced us into no deal May not that be a, uh, an outcome of these uh, of these negotiations? I think there is a certain uh, kind of logic to to that approach. Uh, if if we do negotiate, if the UK does negotiate a deal with the EU, and uh, Boris Johnson presents it to his party in the country as this is the final outcome, this is what we were working for all this time, this is what the whole. Brexit project is about, it's going to be quite difficult for him to come up with something and sell it as something which really justifies all we've been through for the last uh, four and a half years to get to this point. So from that point of view, it might be politically easier, politically in a strange way, the path of least resistance to allow no deal to happen. However, that's probably not the end of the story, as I've suggested, because we may find that we need some kind of deal. And to look at it from the other side, even if we do get a deal, we're seeing uh, the idea that, it, that if you have agreed to something, you can always renege on it later, becoming uh, gaining a bit of credibility at the moment. So it could play both ways. No deal may not be the end of the story, and a deal may not be the end of the story. And you may see pressure from certain quarters for us to pull out of a deal having agreed it. So, so in some ways, uh, it's not still not clear what the end point to all of this is. Thank you very much. Well, it sounds to me as if uh, Mr. Johnson is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. And perhaps that's a reflection on which we can conclude the podcast. Thanks very much, Andrew.